hey, Unlock listeners. This is a special kind of episode. This is not a traditional fly on the wall conversation in which I ask annoying questions to an industry expert. This is an episode with my dear friend and colleague, Dana Lubner. Hi, Dana. Hi, Matt Landau. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm great. I'd like to welcome you here to the Unlocked podcast channel. What does it feel like in this channel? It's an honor to be here, and it feels great. Yeah. It feels a little chilly, I think. (laughs) Dana, you and I have been collaborating for the last few months in the form of a new podcast series called How to Save Your Vacation Rental Business. Have you enjoyed the collaborative process so far, or are we driving you completely nuts? I am having so much fun doing this. I had no idea it would be this fun. Yeah, because we've done a lot of interviews, right? How many interviews have we done with leading advocacy experts over the course of the last few months? I want to say probably somewhere right around maybe 14 interviews. Yeah, it's not like anyone's (laughs) counting. I was going to say like 200. (laughs) I was going to exaggerate just for effect. Um, But this is a really important subject for the vacation rental industry. And frankly, it's one that um, we don't really cover a whole lot on unlocked, the role of a vacation rental business owner or manager in their local advocacy pursuits. And one of the big things that I've learned uh, over the last few months is that you have to be doing something advocacy related. You have to be involved somehow in your destination. Or if you're not, it can all be pulled out from underneath you like it almost was in Denver, right? That's exactly the reality that if we're not paying attention to this, it's, it's, you know, your livelihood, your business that's on the line. So it's, this topic is more important than ever for us to be discussing. And it's also one of those things that a lot of people only realize when it's too late and they wish they had put forth some effort. So Dana, what are we about to listen to today? So today we're going to listen to episode one, the wake up call. This kind of lays the scene, sets the stage of what the rest of the season is going to include. So we get sound bites from the different advocacy experts from around the country that are speaking about the moment of truth that they had when they realized, oh my gosh, I can't wait another day that I have to start focusing on building my advocacy efforts and looking at my regulations in my local destination. Otherwise, there were probably some threatening scenarios that were on the horizon for them for their business. And this is episode one of 10. It's a 10 episode masterclass brought to you by our friends at Track Hospitality Software, Track HS. That's how I like to refer to it. And there are now three episodes at the moment that this is being released on the How to Save Your Vacation Rental Business podcast channel. So Unlock Listener, if you like what you hear, head over and subscribe. It is some delicious listening. Sounds really wonderful inside of your ears. And with that, we should just hit play, no? Let's not make them wait a second longer. got out of hand and city council members ran on platforms that said we want to rein this in and stop this. Unfortunately, what they did was take several draconian measures and took backward steps in eliminating about 70% of all of the formerly licensed and legal properties in New Orleans. The city was basically trying to pass a ban on short-term rentals and even those of us who were in operation would have to stop. Right now in the U.S., we have over 4,200 uh, municipalities. Uh, I would say a, a decent guess is that it, at least half of them at this point have either had the conversation about regulations or are currently having them right now. 
We are trying to figure out exactly how we want to be defined, which has always been something that's been hard for us because we've, we're not going to say flown under the radar, but we've also not been regulated. So there's kind of a, a two-edged sword to that, especially now due to the coronavirus. You need to be extremely aware of the fact that a good actor can have a really bad day and be that story in City Hall. Unless you work with the community to figure out how it makes sense, the battle's not gonna end. I don't think there's gonna be a, a, a tourist destination in the entire US that by the year 2022 won't have some kind of a short-term rental ordinance in place. From my friends at VRMB Communities, this is how to save your vacation rental business, a 10-part educational series about the do's and don'ts of sustainable short-term rentals. This episode is brought to you by Track, powered by TravelNet Solutions, providing integrated solutions to transform the way vacation rental hospitality works. I'm Dana Lubner, and this episode is our wake-up call. In this episode, we learn why inaction Complacency and unwillingness to band together in the face of regulations are the greatest threat to our industry. Community-based advocacy has to be done. It's hard, but it works, and it never stops. Hello, everyone, and welcome to my show. I'm so excited to share everything we've learned from some of the most courageous players in the industry. Hi, Dana. Good morning, Matt. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? It's so good to hear your voice. It's good to hear your voice too. I'm doing well. I'm especially excited because this is the first episode of our podcast together. Are you stoked? I am beyond stoked to be doing this. That's my colleague, Matt Landau from VRMB. I've followed VRMB for a few years now and love the community and how it connects us all at a global level. Matt and I decided to team up to tackle this topic because hope is not a strategy, and this is the biggest threat to our future. I'll lean on him throughout this episode and at certain times throughout the rest of the season. So what, what are we here to talk about today? What is this podcast all about anyway? This podcast is all about advocacy. Or should we say this is not about advocacy at all? Dun, dun, dun. It's bigger than advocacy, but it is related and something that has been near and dear to my heart for the last few years. The word advocacy, we, we like to joke about it, but it's kind of a boring word, right? You hear it and you don't really get excited to listen or do anything. The word can turn people off, whether it's just not something that's exciting or they're intimidated by it. Over the course of our interviews over the last few months, have you come up with a replacement for advocacy? What is this podcast about if it's not about advocacy? The word that I've fallen in love with as a replacement for advocacy is community. And that's really what we're talking about here is how to build community and sustainability for the industry. Phil Minardi, Director of Policy and Communications for Expedia Group, does a great job explaining this intersection of community and advocacy. I would say advocacy is more than policy work. One of the challenges for local alliances is to stay together after a campaign is done. And Dana, I know you understand this acutely. Uh, after the shared goal of policy solutions is behind them, uh, a lot of groups get back to regular order. They go back to the important work of putting heads in beds and welcoming folks to their communities. So. The local alliance, the local group, the local engagement falls by the wayside. The truth is we have an incredible opportunity to position ourselves as community leaders, not just vacation rental operators. Phil's my go-to guy because he's the one that actually shows up, rolls up his sleeves, and genuinely asks how he can help and be of service. Matt, what do you think of community? I've always really liked community, um, but I've also come up with my own uh, replacement, and that is readiness. 
Uh, I've been looking into the world of disaster preparedness, um, preparing for whether it's a natural disaster or um, even something like if you go off hiking in the woods with 16 friends, you need to have some preparedness there, some readiness, whether it's a compass or telephone or a first aid kit. And what we've been learning is that a disaster will strike any given vacation rental destination. If it hasn't already, likely will sometime soon. You got to be ready. To be honest, we're, we're in the reactive group. As much as I said, it would be great for more people to be thinking proactively. You know, we, we are guilty of being reactive as well. So you know, we're, we're kind of right now just fighting the fight and doing whatever we can do to keep our heads above water and, and keep a ban from coming down. That was Jonah Mechanic in San Diego, proving that even the best operators in the industry struggle with these issues every day. So no matter what we call it, whether it's advocacy or community or readiness, we're talking about the same thing here. The basis of this is all about creating sustainability for your business. Yeah. Do you want to continue running your business profitably in the future? If the answer is yes, this is the podcast for you. So Dana, I want to take a moment to heap some praise on you. Would you mind? I'm totally flattered. It's a nice way to start off the podcast season. For those who don't know Dana, uh, she sort of came onto our radar over the last few years with her amazing um, community leadership work in Denver, Colorado. Your Mile High Hosts group is how old now, Dana? Our group started in the spring of 2019. And you were going through this advocacy or community leadership process yourself. You're actively figuring out uh, how to do things with no guidebook or instruction manual. And we thought it would be a great idea to help you do that by introducing you to people who are actively doing it well, but also to document your process, to kind of archive it so that other vacation rental professionals can follow along. What's your big kind of goal for the episodes of this podcast for our listeners? I want to make advocacy and community efforts approachable for everyone. I don't want it to be something that turns uh, them off when they hear the word or they think that they don't have any experience with policy and they can't get into it. I want this to be a practical how-to so everyone feels empowered to step up and do their part. Yeah, I like that. And I, I particularly like your obsession with actionable tips. And there are so many interviews that will be featuring this season where you really just sink your teeth into a topic and ask the expert to explain it on a granular level, how they did it. And that's really what people want to hear. At least that's what you as a leader of an advocacy group in Denver would find useful, right? It's great to hear about everything that people have accomplished, but if you don't understand the step-by-step -step how to get there, it's easy to do nothing instead. And we came up with the very original, very concise and creative title, How to Save Your Vacation Rental Business, right? We, we spent some time brainstorming, no? Had some good ideas thrown into the mix? I think we went back and forth for at least a month. <laughs> Until I started to feel myself getting slightly less intelligent with every proposal. <laughs> Same here. Uh, but then again, uh, I'm not known to be great at naming things. And in the end, we settled on how to save your vacation rental business because that's what people are being forced to do. If you don't start assuring the readiness of your local community, you may find yourself in a position where you don't have a vacation rental business to run anymore. Most of those homes in the Treme that you walk by on the way to some coffee shops and things like that uh, have all been um, had their license non-renewed and their 
their individual business model um, decimated. That was Eric Bay of AMP in New Orleans, sharing how even when you think you're doing everything right, you can't let your guard down. You know, these were um, families in Treme. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of someone who lives in that in that uh, neighborhood who is 77 years old, born and raised Creole, uh, Creole New, New Orleanian, accumulated limited wealth over the course of their life and renovated a beautiful properties in in uh, a post-Katrina devastated city and brought them back to perfection, um, invested blood, sweat, equity, and opened them up to, um, to visiting tourists. They advocated to get licensed and legal and taxes and remit um, additional funding to affordable housing groups. Uh, we've brought in over six million dollars at a dollar per night in 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 uh, into a, ta- uh, a usable fund for affordable housing advocacy, and those people worked um, worked and and spent their entire investment savings and were made legal and were enjoying exactly what we wanted to do. We wanted to share our city, but we wanted to do so responsibly. And then that when that was made illegal. Um, at that point, the, the only ones that were, were benefiting were the, the one half of a unit or the, the unit in a condo building. This reminds me of what it felt like in Denver at the beginning when regulations were defined. But a year later, we found hosts being reported on as though what they were doing was criminal activity. Yeah, your, your personal story, Dana, really struck me. Um, and over the course of the interviews, another thing I've realized is people often use this uh, Maslow's hierarchy, uh, both for, for an individual, uh, but also for a small business, for, for a vacation rental business, for instance. The, the foundational uh, layer of that pyramid is, is the home itself, the property, and then you've got some kind of income, and then eventually you have purpose or fulfillment that you want out of your business. But what I've realized, my big epiphany throughout this learning process is that there's actually an entirely hidden bottom layer about all of our businesses that we don't really think about so much. And it's regulations. It's how are vacation rentals um, defined and regulated in any given destination. And if we're not addressing this bottom, most primordial layer of our health, it can all just be pulled right out from underneath us, no? I couldn't agree more. And the reality is, even if you've been doing advocacy work and you have fair regulations, there's no guarantee that that couldn't change. And so it is something that you consistently have to have eyes on and pay attention to. This podcast is not just a feel-good thing that you should be thinking about. This is directly correlated with people's bottom lines. To see the long-term growth in our industry and, frankly, our businesses, uh, we do need to get involved in community efforts beyond regulations. So for a lot of local alliances, that means transitioning from spending every meeting talking about who's connecting with what city council member to having regular meetings to talk about startup coaching, uh, to transitioning to engaging in community service efforts, to having a focus not just on advocacy best practices, but transitioning to meetings focused on business best practices. So I think the the one thing uh, that I think we should be focusing on, especially as we come out of COVID-19, is recognizing that advocacy, that alliances, uh, that our community uh, has more in common than just a shared policy goal. And to the extent that we can focus our attention on being, um, being true leaders within our community, I think that's gonna go a long distance to inoculating our industry from negative policies that may come down the pipeline in the future. The way that I've been 
explaining this to folks, the more that I've been learning is by simply asking them a question. Do you want to run a profitable business several years into the future? And if the answer to that question is yes, you need to begin thinking about these things right now. The big takeaway from these voices across the vacation rental industry is that this has to be done. In episode two, we'll be looking into how I and several others got into advocacy and provide you with a roadmap for your local community. In episode three, we'll go into the fundamentals of building a local alliance group. In episodes four and five, we'll be learning how to throw an event that highlights your positive community interaction and how to pay for all of this. Later, we'll find out what happens when things go wrong and what to do about it. Dana, we've known advocacy slash not advocacy is important. We've known that now for some time, but I feel like now it's more important than ever before with the adversity uh, as a result of the pandemic. I think the pandemic gave a platform for those that are in opposition to the industry to really amplify their voice and their reasons and their concerns about how the industry is operating. I mean, we've seen this now with the uh, professionals that we've spoken to in locations all around the country, that this isn't an isolated battle that's happening. This is happening uh, with our friends in Nashville. And, um, you know, it continues to happen in San Diego where there's a lot at stake there right now where, you know, platforms are getting involved and hosts are really having to adjust to the way that they have built uh, their livelihoods and, and created revenue streams. Yeah, there's like hotel groups that are looking to take advantage of the chaos, um, looking to almost just close the door and solder it shut when no one else is looking by kind of deeming short-term rentals as non-primary accommodation options while hotels remain open, which to me just sounds crazy. It makes no sense to anybody that understands the industry and the amenities that a vacation rental offers. And in a time of a pandemic, that a hotel would be labeled as the essential lodging accommodation over a short-term rental. It's, it's mind-blowing. Jennifer Frankenstein-Harris of New Smyrna Beach, Florida, went through this process of being listed as non-essential and managed to turn it around. Well, I don't think anything is isolated to New Smyrna Beach. I mean, I've been watching these things go on for the past four months that we've been dealing with COVID-19 in different counties, you know, across the state. So I don't know, you know, I I think a lot of people are just scared. You know, I, I don't know why some of the things that have been happening are happening. I can only relate it back to fear. And when, when you're not knowledgeable and you don't know, like we don't know enough about this virus, Um, then you act out of fear. So one of the things that we saw across the state was condo association boards and homeowner association boards. And these are boards of volunteer people, just so everybody understands what a COA or an HOA board is. They've, They've made decisions that completely take away the property rights of the people who own in that building or own in that community. They have made decisions saying um, you can't come to your home. If, you, if you're not a primary resident, you can't come to your home. Like th- this happened in the Outer Banks, right? They closed the bridge. They didn't care if you owned a house there or not. You couldn't go to your private property. Um, I've had condo associations say, hey, we're not going to let any renters. We don't even use the word renters. I mean, they're guests. We're not going to allow any guests to come to our condo. Now, if you own there or live there, that's fine, but they're not going to let a renter come. Well, most of my owners rely on the rental revenue to pay their mortgage and their taxes and their maintenance fees. Um, I've had other, 
other condo complexes, when, when Governor DeSantis came out with his, he, he phased the first executive order to stop vacation rentals. Mind you, hotels never closed. Hotels were open. Hotels and resorts in the state of Florida, timeshares in the state of Florida, all open. Just vacation rentals, not open. Um, his first executive order said, if you were doing a 30-day rental, you could come. Nothing shorter than 30 days. Well, I had some condo association boards that thought that was a really good idea. And so they're, they're now going to only have 30-day rentals because the governor said it. So now we're going to do that. Well, you can't do that. You can't take away somebody's right to use their property. So, you know, we've seen just government overreach, whether it's a local government or ordinance or, or a little volunteer condo board, which, as most people know, they consist of people who live on site, don't rent their properties, and they hate, quote unquote, those people at their building, even though as a condo owner, you have the same rights and your guest has the same rights as an owner. Wow. I mean, so what what did you do? What was... What were some of the first steps when you saw that hotels were being deemed as essential and allowed to operate? What does somebody who's who knows so much better than than the nonsense of this decision? What does one do? I'm telling you, I, it, it was one of the most frustrating experiences because you don't know what to do. Okay, first and foremost, I don't even feel comfortable today encouraging travel, encouraging people to come to our vacation homes, because I feel, I feel like maybe I could be doing something wrong. You know, could I, could I be contributing to this, um, you know, spread it is, I would certainly never want to feel, you know, responsible for that, but people are going to travel. So they are going to, they are going to go and they should be able to be in a safe arena, right? So absolutely vacation homes and condos are much safer than a resort or a hotel with shared spaces. Um, and you know, there's been enough studies on that. Even the head of infectious disease at Florida state university was giving a, a webinar on COVID-19 and he popped up a, a graph of the lowest risk activities to the highest risk activities and actually on this man's graph, it said staying in a vacation home. It was on the low risk um, line item, staying in a vacation home. Staying in a hotel was at medium risk. So even, you know, medical experts are saying, hey, you should be staying in a vacation home. It's the lowest risk. So, you know, that's that's the rationale. I say, well, I've, I've got to provide this service to people who are going to travel. Through her existing community advocacy network and relationships with legislative aides and other officials, Jennifer was able to reclassify vacation rentals and get her business open. If there isn't a community already built, when a pandemic hits, there is no united voice to respond or to educate or relationships built with city legislators to have the discussion about the value that a vacation rental really can provide during a time of crisis. And so it becomes more important than ever and more obvious than ever when you don't have that advocacy community built when something like this happens. Paige Teal in Maine was another example of someone who was living through conflicting messages from officials and was able to defend the value of vacation rentals because of her advocacy group. Because we pay taxes, because we do everything by the books, because we've been following the legislation, because we haven't, you know, we didn't, we, there was a time there we couldn't even accept reservations. We didn't even know if we were going to have, um, you know, be allowed to have guests come in. And that type of scariness, you know, is, is, the, is a whole other thing. But for her to step up there and, and just kind of do it as an afterthought to say, because she only started saying that once we blew down the doors of the commissioner saying, hey, don't forget about vacation rentals. And then the next press release, the governor said, oh, and Airbnb types. And so the fact that it's kind of thrown in as an afterthought, but also kind of lumped together with Airbnb, uh, and, and I'm not, you know, no shade to Airbnb, but professionally managed vacation rental companies um, and just vacation rentals, period, um, is kind of 
my biggest thing. That verbiage just kind of, it felt like it was kind of a, I don't know, just like a dirty type of <laughs> way to lump us all together. I don't know. I just, I just, I didn't, it's not who we are, you know, and that's my biggest thing is, you know, Airbnb, yes, they're, they're rolling out, you know, cleaning procedures and safety inspections, but that's something that we've been doing right along since the very beginning. Some of these folks have been doing it for 30 years. Um, so f- I think for a lot of them, they're, they're frustrated to say, you know, can you at least recognize that we've gone above and beyond what the state has required, what our homeowners require, what the fire department requires, what the town, you know, code and law enforcement officer requires. And that's all under the auspice of the vacational professionals of Maine. So that's my biggest frustration is to say, you know, we're protecting the public um, and the tourism that, you know, come into Maine and, and we should be recognized for that. I think it's really a time when communities are being forced to step up and this has to do with the health of your local community, Uh, like not throwing gigantic Airbnb parties in the middle of a pandemic, for instance. Um, It has to do with the laws and um, being good neighbors. It's kind of a chance for the communities to to solve their own problems. And if you don't have that kind of infrastructure in place, it's exposed now. I think you hit the nail on the head. It is about accountability and the way things have been operating haven't been working ultimately. And this is truly a, a chance to be a part of how we want to shape this community moving forwards. And this is partly a result of just having a new industry. Like we are almost by definition, fragmented and broken up into tons of individual little pieces. This is our biggest weakness. We don't have the kind of unity or organization that a more mature industry might. And I think that's what the pandemic for me has exposed is those relationships, like you said, at the very core level and the hard work that's being put in ahead of time in preparation for a disaster like this, it's either in place already and you have a chance of surviving or you have to begin right now. And it's not too late, right? It's a matter of evolving or dying. Um, It's, you know, I don't mean to sound so despair there, but we've truly been all marching to the beat of our own drum and operating in different ways that are not united. And it becomes so obvious when there are regulations or, uh, you know, crises that happen that cause us to really see how exposed we are when we're not unified with our voice. The pandemic is providing the final, impossible-to-ignore wake-up call to join advocacy efforts. But the people we're talking to this season heard the call before all of this began. Let's listen to what Megan McRae in Nashville has to say when I ask her about the moment she first got involved. Tell us about the moment of truth when you knew you had to get involved with advocacy. Paint a little bit of a picture of... uh, what the what the struggle was and maybe internally as well as externally sure well it was actually i mean i'm gonna say it was a month or two after we had started welcoming guests airbnb hosted a meetup here in the community it was when they were launching co-hosts so it was a while ago and i met the president of nastra at the time there who came and said listen, the city is planning to shut us down. And I just remember, I I remember the feeling of like, what are you talking about? You know, my heart just sank. I I couldn't really wrap my head around why anyone would think this is bad. Right. Um, And I, she passed out information about coming to a meeting. And so I went, my husband and I went and the stuff I was hearing just, it, it almost sounded unreal to the point where I actually did question, are these people saying, could they be telling us the truth that this is happening? (laughs) 
And then I started doing research and lo and behold, it, it was true. The city was basically trying to pass a ban on short-term rentals. And even those of us who were in operation would have to stop. And even though it was early, I was already too far into it as far as like welcoming guests and just really enjoying it that even though I still had a full-time thing and this was just a hobby, I honestly couldn't imagine what it would be like to not do it anymore. And I started volunteering with the organization and met several other hosts and found out I was not alone in that feeling. And 90% of the hosts were super involved, very engaged in the day-to-day, really interacting with their guests, showing them places, you know, I always say beyond Broadway. And I just thought, like, we can't have this. And that was when I knew I had to fight, just not only for myself and for our guests, but for these fellow hosts who felt the same way that I did. Amazing. So it sounds like the group, your moment of truth when you got involved, um, that wasn't when the advocacy group started. The advocacy group, uh, Nastro, was already formed at the time? It was. And it really didn't even start as an advocacy group. They started it as just a host connection group. But they didn't get too far into that because literally it started and then legislation started happening as well. So they quickly had to pivot and and get into the advocacy role. Megan is going to be a key voice over the next several episodes in teaching us how to join, organize, and motivate a local host organization. I challenge you to begin thinking, what's your wake-up call? You may be in the middle of your wake-up call right now. It may be a few months from now. Either way, I guarantee you it's going to happen. And now, a word from our sponsor. Track Hospitality Software is powered by TravelNet Solutions, an industry-leading hospitality company. Track is a portfolio software designed specifically with your vacation rental management company in mind. From cloud contact center to property management software, including features such as trust accounting, maintenance, housekeeping, owner portal, guest portal, channel distribution, and more, all in one platform. Create seamless operations and increase revenue with Track. To learn more about Track Hospitality Software, visit trackhs.com. Across the nation, as we've seen these regulatory fights develop, two key themes of compromise and self-enforcement have emerged. Here is Phil describing what victory looks like in the regulatory fight. I would say victory is a compromise policy that responsibly regulates our industry in a way that protects good actors and gives them the certainty that they need to invest in their business for the long term, but also one that gives communities the certainty that they need to know that our industry um, is going to be a positive member of the community. Uh, And I think we've seen that in more instances now than we have in the past. And I think the best policies are ones where we're not going to have to come back and relitigate them in the next six months, in the next year. Uh, And we only do that through compromise. Here's a perfect example of this in action. Phil recently helped create a memorandum of understanding with the city of San Diego to finally put an end to years of uncertainty for local vacation rental businesses. Jonah Mechanic of Seabreeze Vacation Rentals spoke to me about the kind of self-enforcement that really makes for functional regulations. The end goal is that the short-term rental industry funds what's necessary to support this program which would then fund the code compliance department so they could hire extra officers. That was essential in the development of this. Um, And I want to make sure I hit on that because anyone who's listening, who's trying to develop an ordinance somewhere else, trust me, 
you can have the best ordinance in the world, but if there's no funding for enforcement, it is never going to get off the ground and it's never going to be effective. Um, so by the numbers we have, based on what the current costs are for permits for the MOU, uh, it's going to raise about $6 million a year, which, is, which would be bookmarked specifically for code compliance. What that means is that code compliance can hire what are called PISO officers. They are usually retired um, police officers. They're able to issue citations. They are in uniform and they do drive police cars. However, they do not carry weapons. So that's the difference between a regular police officer and a PISO officer. Um, going back to what we talked about, when your cranky old neighbor calls to complain about the kids jumping in a pool and being too loud, she would call a specific number, which would go to the code compliance department. The code compliance department would send a PISO officer out to the property to see if the complaint is legit or not legit. Certainly if it's legit, then the PISO officer would alert the, the guests that they're in violation of a certain ordinance and basically knock it off. If it's not legit, the code, the code compliance officer would let whoever complained know, basically, you know, <laughs> knock it off. Your boy who cried wolf thing isn't going to work. And, you know, we know what you're doing and it's basically not going to work. So <clears throat> that is probably one of the most important aspects of this as well, is to have a neutral party be able to be the judge as to if a short term rental is in violation or not. Because we all know that there will be, I can tell you with 100 percent certainties, there will be neighbors who certain, who just don't like vacation rentals and they're going to try and call in every day to try and get complaints logged so that the, the owner can lose their permit. So it was very important to us to make sure that a neutral independent party was the one who was going to re report to the property to determine if it's just the neighbor being, you know, an old cranky neighbor or if it actually is the guest causing an issue. The takeaway to remember here from regulatory battles across the country and from recent efforts during the pandemic is that community-based advocacy groups work. They often face a long struggle, but they are the only way to help shape the sustainability of your vacation rental business. Two of the main players we see in these regulatory battles are OTAs and anti-vacation rental groups. OTA stands for Online Travel Agency. Think of Airbnb, Verbo, Expedia, Booking.com. In the show, we're going to be talking to both of these groups and from hosts that know how to deal with them in an effort to give you the tools you need to best navigate the landscape. I spoke with Phil on how hosts can take advantage of OTA involvement. There's, there's kind of two avenues to, to get connected with Expedia Group. Uh, the first way is by uh, reaching out to us. And you can do that uh, by two, two avenues. Number one, you can go to verboadvocates.com, uh, which is a website we have that gives uh, a background on advocacy efforts, gives you a little bit uh, of support when it comes to messaging about fair and effective regulations. Um, and gives you access to some of the Vacation Rental Alliances uh, that we're helping across the United States today. So I would encourage folks to, to visit verboadvocates.com. Um, also, uh, we have government affairs at verbo.com. Uh, so if folks are listening and whether they've had a local alliance for five years and want to take it to the next level, or they want to get involved themselves, or they want to start a group, people are more than happy to reach out to governmentaffairs at verbo.com. Um, and then also just reach out to me directly. So pminardi at expedia.com or pminardi at verbo.com, uh, and you can get me directly. Um, happy to connect and, and talk one-on-one -on -one with folks that are looking to get engaged uh, more robustly. Um, but then also uh, it's incumbent upon us as a platform to reach out to folks uh, that may be going through these, these fights themselves. So we do quite a bit of outreach uh, to property managers that are in communities that may be facing local regulations or may be on the precipice of having these conversations locally. Uh, to date, over the course of the last two and a half years, we've helped create or support uh, over 147, I believe, uh, local alliances at this point. Um, so hopefully the folks on this phone, if you haven't heard from us, you will. Uh, but if you haven't and you want us to help, support, engage, uh, hear what's happening in your community, 
you can reach out to me directly or go to verboadvocates.com or governmentaffairs at verbo.com. Awesome. Um, curious if Expedia Group offers things like, um, you know, the ability to send people to speak or testify at public meetings or have conversations with city officials. Yeah, absolutely. So we, Expedia Group's government affairs team, um, covers different regions. So we have a government affairs manager that covers the East Coast, that covers the West Coast, that covers uh, the Midwest, that covers the South Central. Uh, and these folks spend every waking moment, every day, uh, seven days a week, uh, 24 hours a day in some cases, um, not only helping local property managers, but going to city council meetings uh, meeting with elected officials, meeting with governors, meeting with mayors, meeting with city council members uh, to not only convey the value proposition of the vacation rental marketplace, uh, but also help elected officials understand what fair and effective policies look like. So absolutely, if you haven't, again, reach out to me directly and I'm happy to make that connection. And now is a good chance to share our third major takeaway of this episode. Advocacy is hard. Here is Jonah reminding us that the OTAs are not going to do our job for us. We don't do this for a living. You know, we're not we're not looking at how to navigate political landscape downtown 24-7. We're, we're looking at how are we going to get houses clean before four o'clock when the guests are banging on the door and their kids are crying in the back of the car. So to have someone, you know, like Expedia have our back and a true partner has been essential. And there's no way we'd be there today without it. Now, with that being said, <clears throat> to anyone listening right now, keep in mind that Expedia is a worldwide organization and they're not only focused on protecting short-term rentals in on your little slice of, of the globe, they have a worldwide business to manage across the board. They are not going to do the heavy lifting for you. They are not gonna form the local organizations, put in the groundwork, they, they can't, um, nor should they. So what they look for is a well-organized, well-run, and well-funded local organization that they can assist. So you as the local need to be the one to start the organization, to, to round the troops up, to get your website started, to start your advocacy, to start meeting with people downtown, to really show these OTAs that, hey, we got our proverbial stuff together, right? We're committed, we're a local um, organization made with local homeowners and restaurant owners that are already committed to this cause, that have already started a group, that are already collecting funds, that are already meeting with council members downtown. We're already got this ball rolling. Now, Expedia, can you help us? Can you help support us in our efforts? Expedia has been very good in situations like that, whether it be Los Angeles, San Diego, Palm Springs, the list goes on and on. However, don't just think that you can sit back, really do nothing and hope that Expedia is just gonna come in and save the day because they're not and and nor should they. Um, and that's something that, you know, we're, we're very full, thankful for, but at the same time, I've had conversations with other hosts, you know, in different cities that seem to think that, well, it's okay, Expedia or Airbnb are just gonna come in and save the day. And I have to educate them that, you know what, that's not really how it works at all. Another hard aspect of this fight is engaging with anti-vacation rental groups, many who may seem unreasonable at the outset. When we dig a little deeper, they're often just neighbors concerned about the health of their local communities. Claire of Sand and Sea Properties in Galveston, Texas, has built a successful business and host community. I asked her how to engage with this kind of opposition group. It's hard having difficult conversations and especially walking right into a room where, as you said, they'll throw tomatoes at you. Um, do you have any strategic advice about how to approach groups that you would consider um, as opposition or ways that you would just suggest that approach overall? Listen to them. Take the tomatoes. So one of my first things that I had to do in Galveston back in 2004 was, is and it was no sweat off my back because I had, I had just come back to town. So, um, so I would stand at these community meetings and I'd say, I'm here to listen. What are the biggest problems that you have with vacation rentals? And 
you know, some people were nice explaining the problems. Other people were angry. I took copious notes. We gathered them up. And then the GARM companies just sat down together and said, what are we going to do about it? Now, listen, it's not easy to sit there and have people criticize you and criticize your business and, and, and just complain. It's not easy. But in the end, we were able to say, wow, there's only three things they're really concerned with. They're concerned with over-occupancy, with noise, and parking problems. And Oh, and trash. And trash was another one. And all of those, we said, we can cope with all of these. And that's when we came up with the solutions that ended up um, evolving into the common registrations, um, uh, police officers to patrol. We knew that people having that phone number 24-7 was critical. And um, uh, we, we mandated how many trash cans that each um, homeowner had to get from the city to make sure that trash was handled adequately. And then, of course, our GARM officers are helping maintain the parking regulations. We agreed to four cars per house in any given subdivision on the West End. So all of those things, we said, you know, it's really not, you know, when you sit down and listen to people, you're going to find common threads in what they're asking for, which will help you come up with solutions. This season, we decided to do just that. Listen and share with you what we learned. Here's Jessica Black of Moms Against Vacation Rentals on what needs to happen to find compromise in communities across the nation. I think you have to work with the community to be sustainable because you you can't just commodify an entire community and have that work long term. There has to it has to work for the people that live there. Going through the battle here in my town, you know, you hear all this stuff. Oh, live like a local, belong anywhere. I mean, bring people together. It, it was a war, and it felt like it was tearing our community apart. Um, and, and it still, in a sense, is because those short-term rental owners sued and there's still this looming threat of them trying to preempt our ordinance again. And, I mean, you can fight and fight and fight to, to get in somewhere where you're not wanted, but it's it's not going to end well. <laughs> um, you know, I, I've thought, well, if we've kind of come up in my brain, contingency plans, like, okay, say, say their lawsuit succeeds or say they do get a preemption bill what would I do? I don't think many neighbors would just roll over and say, oh, well, I guess I live next to a hotel now. <laughs> um, you know, we've, we've talked about, okay, maybe we go and form a one rule HOA and handle it that way. Although, you know, if all the neighbors had to go spend money to do it. That's a little annoying. And it would probably end up just being the more affluent neighborhoods that could afford to do that. You know, there's private nuisance lawsuits. There's just sticking the, you know, we don't want Airbnb in our neighborhood signs in the front yard and making guests. So so it's, unless you work with the community to figure out how it makes sense, the battle's not going to end. The final key takeaway from this episode is the fight never stops. Here is Paige on Advocacy Never Sleeping and how to keep up the fight while keeping some balance in your life. Advocacy never stops. Um, and that's one thing that I've newly had to, uh, I guess, learn or take advice from, you know, folks like yourself or from Audrey or from other people who have been in that fine balance to say, you know, it's, it's okay to, you know, do an autoresponder and say you're out of the office. It's okay not to accept the the phone call because I do feel guilty in a way you know you, you feel like I have a lot of personal responsibility in my job um, in the role that I have as president and I have to remind myself that you know I am I am one person and I can try to do as much as I can but you know relying on my team and relying on on the experience around me um, is also something that I have to remind myself daily to just say you know it's not all on you you have to you know, delegate and you have to be okay with not getting it all done and you can't work 25 hours a day. So <laughs> that's, it's, it's a constant reminder. I mean, I, if I could put a reminder in my phone every day at one o'clock to remind myself to breathe and to eat, <laughs> I probably, it probably would help me a lot at this point, especially. And here is Eric Bay on what happens if the fight does stop. 
it was it was fairly hard to um, to pitch the idea of membership when some of the members said, "Well, we failed. We don't have licenses anymore. We're not licensed. We're not legal. Why do we want to even continue?" Uh, which which was a whole nother challenge trying to explain to them. Um, you know, initially we said, "If you're not at the table, they're going to eat you for lunch." Uh, well, now we're at the table and maybe they some feel they have eaten us for lunch um but there, there's still a few more courses left in the meal and we need to become we need to stay active um as, as a vocal player um it's just a matter of getting them to not be discouraged and saying hey collectively we can do this if it's just you one person you're not either gonna have the intuition or the inclination or, or the desire to go forward but everybody in this room has that same goal and that same mindset. So, so um, collectively, we could we could do this. It's important for those who are too afraid, and for those who are um, lacking the knowledge or the resources, or for your housekeeper, or for your gardener, or for your maintenance man. So this problem is bigger than you, and 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 we we need you to to join the efforts to make sure that you're helping not only you, but others. And for me, Dana, one of the things that is consistent throughout is independent owners and managers, stakeholders of any given destination, participating, raising their hand, stepping forward, contributing to their short-term rental community. Of course, some people do it much more than others. Some people do it in different ways than others. But in the best instances, there are communities where the stakeholders have decided to individually step up and act as a group. Um, and the very harsh reality for the people who are listening, and, and perhaps worse, the people who are not listening to this podcast, is that if you're not participating in your short-term rental community, if you're not in some way contributing to that local greater good, you have absolutely no right to complain about the industry when things go wrong. You have absolutely no right to point fingers when there's some kind of crisis hitting. All right, listener, the ball is in your court. Now is the time to get involved. Find your local short-term rental advocacy group and tell them you want to attend the next meeting. Don't have a local group? Call your competitor or a colleague down the street and form a group. And remember, Phil from Expedia Group and Dave from Rent Responsibly are great resources to lean on. And of course, you can always reach out to me. I'm happy to help you in any way I can. If you'd like my personal input on your destination, feel free to reach out to me at Dana at EffortlessRentalGroup.com and I would be happy to connect with you. We want to give a shout out to Rented, the leading provider of full service revenue management for professional vacation rental managers for helping us get this important word out. Consider this your wake-up call. This has to be done. It works, but it is hard. It never stops, but again, it has to be done. In this season, we'll learn how to build your group, how to get the attention of government, how to tell a public story, how to pay for it, and how not to burn out while doing so. I'm Dana Lubner, and thank you for listening. Please leave us a review or comment on your platform of choice and tune in next week for episode two, Journey into Advocacy. Make sure you subscribe today so you don't miss a single episode.